So these are some of the things that I will cover today. I guess uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about critical thinking in the doctoral process. And so I really ought to turn these into propositions. And therefore, my propositions are that uh, where we are situated in, in a historical context is important. And it explains where we've come from and where we're going in the academic research process a little bit. It situates us. Um, I, my proposition is that uh, also that research into doctoral supervision will inform us and help us develop. Uh, and my main proposition is that a range of approaches is what we need in order to develop. Uh, but this is a work in progress, and I am very happy to take critiques and comments and snide remarks and any, anything you want to, uh, to throw at me, because I'm really all the time trying to refine it and make it better. So, the brief history, my first proposition. Um, the first doctorate was awarded a very long time ago, or the first doctorates were awarded. I don't know whether the first, very first one was Bologna or Paris. Um, but the interesting thing about it was that it was then a license to teach. There was an oral examination, which, is, which has lasted to today, um, but it was a license to teach. And it lasted that way for the next six, seven hundred years. Um, that's what it was. And then Humboldt came in and revolutionized the idea of the university and therefore revolutionized the doctoral process because he said the university is about research and the doctoral process is therefore about developing the best research it can be. And from Humboldt, we had this idea of the student working on their own with their research project, which might take a very long time and it might be the crowning glory of their career, and they might get it at about 55 or 60. Um, but it was a license to research. So again, a, a, a di several different things coming in from that. And then the first PhD in Yale was awarded in, in America. Australia has done a lot of work on the doctoral process and, and is very interesting. Uh, they've recently just started awarding more PhDs to females than to males. They've just gone over the 50%, um, which is quite interesting. Uh, the growth across Europe was really quite recent. When we think the first one was awarded in Bologna, first ones were awarded in Bologna and Paris, the growth across Europe has been uh, relatively recent. The growth across Eastern Europe has been even more recent. Um, and then those last two figures, I know, I know they're not... In, in percentage terms, you haven't got anything. I'm really talking about critical mass, the reasons I've put those last two figures up. So 50,000 PhDs, it is claimed, were awarded in China in 2009. I mean, even if that figure is out by 50%, it's still a lot. <laughs> um, and, then, and then we look at the very small numbers in Estonia, and that was a good year for Estonia um, because they tried to bundle a lot of people through. Uh, and, uh, and 175. And so it, you can see the critical mass is evolving in different places in different ways. And I'm really interested to be here because your, your priority and the, um, the, the focus that you're putting on doctoral research is very strong and very organized in comparison with many other universities that I go to. Um, so the process is clearly very important uh, here, and rightly so. But what does the history tell us? Well, we have to look then at the Humboldtian model and say, where are we now? Uh, well, in the Humboldtian time, we had an elite, mainly white male, um, population of doctoral researchers, and now it is mass, diverse, and international. And over lunch, there was a little talk about how important it is to to develop as an international community. That also has implications for supervision. Um, it was very interesting to hear Eric talking about the master to apprenticeship relationship, the apprentice to master, really, relationship, um, and, uh, and how some many doctoral students still see it as that. Uh, it's interesting also he came up with colleagues, because that's a kind of another view. The student as consumer or co-producer of knowledge is kind of how I phrased it, but so I think we're probably in the same kind of area there. When I was in Bahrain, it was, it was very interesting. Someone put up their hand and said, and, but what about the student as someone to be moulded? 
which I thought was really interesting at the doctoral level, um, that, that, that to, to see it quite in that way. The focus study is developing, um, and I'd be very interested in your discussions in a minute, um, how you see that uh, playing out in your own web work. But the multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary work that is going on is growing hugely, and in some cases threatening the hegemony of some of the disciplines, actually. And that's another area that we have to look at. Collaboration is hugely important, and I know you do that very well here, but it does raise a lot of questions. There's a very interesting document that you can get online from the European Universities Association called CODOC, looking at collaborations between different countries. And they, they are arguing, they, they look at collaborations between um, Europe and um, South America, I think Africa, and other parts of Europe, um, and maybe the States as well. Um, but they investigate various collaborations. And one of the things they say is that uh, a collaboration often starts because academics meet at a conference. OK, good, so far. Um, but then uh, there are lots of other factors that come into play as to whether it survives or not uh, in the long term. And if nothing else comes into play, then it probably won't. It will survive as long as those two or three or four key academics are around and want it to survive. And so a collaboration to be in the longer term successful means that different people from different universities need to make links um, up and down a hierarchical chain and across various uh, institutes and departments. That's key. And the other thing they say that is very key, and it's kind of obvious, but it's worth reminding ourselves of it, is that a collaboration has to have equal benefit for all parties. And of course, we, we've all seen some exploitative collaborations uh, and they just, they're just, it just warns us that they're really short term. Um, the external involvement is interesting because there didn't used to be any, and now there is lots. Um, the outcomes are interesting. It's again a bit the apprentice to mastership thing. We're tr in the Humboldtian model, we're trying to make more like ourselves. That's still quite a strong pull, I think. Um, but in theory, we're talking about moving on and creating for the future. The awards were only a PhD by research. And the new route, uh, you are doing PhDs by research here, aren't you? you do, uh, are you aware of the new routes at all? It's, it's an interesting phase that it might just be um, helpful to know about. It's particularly in the UK, but not exclusively so. And they created um, a, a route of doctorates, which were, are also professional um, licenses to practice. So you can have an EngD, an engineering doctorate. You can have a PsychD, a psychology doctorate. You can have an EdD, which is an education doctorate. And the difference between those and the traditional PhD by research is that when you have these professional doctorates, you bring people together for um, probably the first two years, and they have a taught part. Um, and, uh, and they do a lot of general background stuff because the, their doctorate is also going to give them a license to practice. So they have a taught part, they have quite deep assessed pieces of work that they have to do, and then they have two years to do their research. Now the interesting thing that has happened is that uh, people doing PhDs by research, supervising PhDs by research, tend to look down their noses at those doing the professional doctorates. But the really interesting thing that's happened is that this, this taught part, people are saying, well, actually, we can see some benefits in this. And so you see the PhD process actually now encouraging more cohort activity, more pump priming, more bringing together of doctoral students, um, which I think is coming out of the professional doctorate route, but, but it's not something that's openly admitted by quite a lot of people. But it's interesting seeing that happening. And then, of course, the funding... He who pays the piper calls the tune. Um, and either self-funded or philanthropic funding was the past pattern. And now there are lots of issues that I'm sure you're very familiar with about commercial accountability and political accountability in terms of government funding is, is becoming very focused, I've noticed. So what I want to do this afternoon, uh, and I will make sure that we finish in good time, because I gather that the room goes up in a puff of smoke at 4.30, so we've absolutely got to be out of here by then. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so what I'm going to do this afternoon is kind of divide this into three parts. The first part, which uh, we've started and we're going to go on to, is to look at what we think the doctoral process is for. The second part is to look, to look at how we define the doctoral process. And then the third part is to look at different approaches to doctoral supervision. And I've got enough material to keep us all happy for a week, but I will make sure that it only lasts the next three hours. <laughs> Um, if I show slides, because I've, do, I've been doing, as I'm sure we all do and you all do, I've been thinking about the best way of putting things and changing things around and creating new slides long after I sent the handouts over. Um, so if I show slides that aren't on the handout or that you're particularly interested in or that we co-create, I'm very happy to make another pack and send it on to be circulated to everybody that's here afterwards. Uh, and also, if I'm, again, equally, if I mention things that we haven't, got to hand. I'm happy to send them on as handouts too. Uh, I start often actually with that picture. Does anybody know what it is? It's not a million miles away from here, across a certain bridge. Yes, well done, thank you. It's Carl Linnaeus, von Linnaeus. Uh, it's a depiction in the botanical gardens in Uppsala of his tree of life and his binomial theory. Uh, and uh, the reason for putting it up there is to remind myself of the story of him as a supervisor, which maybe everybody knows, but it, it still amuses me. He was, he was obviously quite a character, um, probably absolutely obsessive if you look at his work. It's just, it, it, he has to have had some form of OCD or something, I think, probably. Um, but he... Um, he, he left Sweden only once. I think he came to Denmark. He did his medical degree in Holland. He went to Paris, the UK, and back. And he was probably away for about three years. Uh, and yet he managed to categorize plants and geology and quite a lot of animals from all around the world. How did he do it? How did he do it? He moved the world to him. He moved the world to him, yes, but how? Yes. <laughs> he sent out his doctoral students, some of whom died in the attempt, I have to say. <laughs> um, and I'm not suggesting this is necessarily a good way forward. But I am suggesting there's a quite a big picture here in terms of our careers. The research that we are managing has, is all part of how we manage our careers as well. Uh, and there's, a, there's also an ethical question here about the use and abuse of our doctoral students. Um, because was it use of our doctoral students, i.e. good use of, of Linnaeus's doctoral students, because uh, some of them went on to have magnificent careers of their own, or was it abuse in the sense that some of them didn't survive? And there, and there are big ethical questions for us to look at. 